So I'm going to talk about uh, tobacco control, looking back and looking forward. And I'm going to start with a premise, and I believe this is unarguable. Tobacco control is the single most important and greatest public health success story of the last half century in developed countries. And I'll give you some evidence behind that. However, and this we will talk about as well in more detail, significant further progress in the field of tobacco control may be hard to come by. I'm going to talk about some mixed uh, data trends, some issues that we're worried about with regard to developments in tobacco. Look at uh, the remaining smoking population and think about how we might uh, contemplate their journey from tobacco users to non-tobacco users, if indeed they will make that journey. Uh, and then talk about the incremental utility of what are, in fact, our proven interventions. How much more success can we have with them? So I'm going to talk first about the tobacco control success story to date. How did we get here? Uh, a little bit about the nature of the remaining problem, prospects and problems for the future, some potential new policy directions, and then I'll conclude with some take-home messages. I was told when I became dean, you always need to leave people with something to take home. So these will be messages for you. That, that was told to me, by the way, by my predecessor who had a little candy dish on the desk as people were leaving the room, and she said, I always wanted to be able to make people feel like they were leaving when they saw the dean leaving with something. <laughs> All right, so some limitations. Uh, I'm going to refer only to the developed country context, and the worst part of that is that the talk is going to be completely US-centric. Uh, I have to apologize for that. Canada has been you know, one of the great leaders internationally in tobacco control, and you've had more success at tobacco control than we have. Not a lot more, but you've had some more. Uh, but I'm going to talk about what I know best, so that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to ignore the framework convention on tobacco control. My guess is that many of you have no idea what the framework convention on tobacco control is, other than the fact that uh, Roberta mentioned it in the introduction. Uh, it is a global treaty on tobacco control. It's the world's first international health treaty. It was uh, developed by the World Health Organization, which interestingly has always had in its purview the authority to mount international health treaties. It had never used it. Now it has used it. This treaty has been more widely adopted and more rapidly adopted than almost any treaty in history. There are over 170 nations that have ratified it, including yours, not, alas, including mine. My country not being a treaty-friendly country, it turns out. <laughs> I'm going to draw on a lot of evidence-based knowledge, and uh, you will see that, but I'm also going to engage in speculation. And I hope you will forgive me for that, but we are looking toward the future, and that requires a look at spec with some speculation. So I said it was the greatest public health success story of the past half century. Here are the U.S. figures. Half of all ever smokers alive today have quit. U.S. smoking prevalence has more than halved at this point. Millions of lives have been saved. I'll talk more about that. And the image and place of smoking, certainly in our society and yours and in most developed nations, has been changed forever. So think about it this way. This is the you know, schematic on the U.S. smoking population in the, let's say, late 40s, 1950s, early 60s. Almost half of adults were smokers. And this is what we're looking at today. Now, I think you probably know the numbers in many instances, but if you take a look at these two, it tells you smoking went from being very normative behavior to being aberrant behavior, and I, you all know that. Uh, this is a complicated uh, graph. I'm going to just mention two aspects of it. One, whoops, I didn't want to do that. I didn't bring a pointer. Does anybody have a pointer handy on them? Okay, I'll use the old-fashioned public health technique. If you take a look at the yellow line, this is adult per capita cigarette consumption in the U.S. So this is total cigarettes divided by the population over the age of 17. And what it shows you is that there was a virtually uninterrupted run upwards through 1963, which is the highest level you see where it says first certain general's report is just before that. First certain general's report comes out in 1964, and since then we've had a quite steady, at least since 1973, steady decline to the point where in 2010, per capita consumption, we're back to where we were in the 1930s at this stage. Uh, for reasons I will try to explain in a, in a few minutes, 
I believe that had it not been for the anti-smoking campaign, all the knowledge we've gleaned about the dangers of smoking and all that we have done as a consequence of that knowledge, per capita consumption in the U.S. would be about four times higher than it is today. And I'll show you why I say that. The other thing to note, and I'm not going to talk about them individually, is that once you get beyond that peak, and actually once before it, you'll see that there are discernible drops in per capita consumption associated with very specific events in tobacco control. Now, that's not to say that these events are, are responsible for the entirety of the success, but rather you can see significant blips occurring as a consequence of tobacco, major tobacco control events. All right, the health consequences of the anti-smoking campaign. Please don't write down this number as the gospel, the greater than five million figure you see here. We did some research in the 80s when we came up with a number through the 1980s. This is a totally kind of off the top of my head ballpark, but I think conservative figure, estimating that if it were not for people's decisions to not start smoking or to quit smoking as a result of the U.S. anti-smoking campaign, we would have had over five million more premature deaths than we have had. Smoking produced premature deaths. And on average, each of these individuals would have lost 15 to 20 years of life expectancy had they died as a result of the tobacco consumption. Now, some of you are probably sitting there and scratching your head and saying, wait a minute, I know you lose about seven, eight, nine years of life expectancy if you're a smoker. That's true. But only about one out of two lifelong smokers is killed by smoking, so the one who's killed by it loses double that amount. That's where this 15 to 20 years range comes from. That's an extraordinary loss of life expectancy associated with a single behavior. All right, some images. And um, this, the, I, I've used these images for many years, and it used to be when I would put them up on the screen, I'd point to each one of them and say, who's that? And everybody would shout out the name. And I find that the longer I use these and the younger the crowd gets, they don't know who any of them are. I have an undergraduate class, 300 undergraduates, and they have no idea who any of these people are. <laughs> when I tell them, they sometimes recognize the names, but I won't put you on the spot. But we're looking at the, on the left here at Humphrey Bogart and Loren Bacall. Humphrey Bogart was sort of the essence of male sexuality in the movies back in the 50s. He was always smoking, and uh, he died of lung cancer in his 50s. Some of you will recognize John Wayne in the next picture. This is the Duke. Uh, he bragged of beating the big C when he had a tumorous lung removed and subsequently died of cancer. Uh, he didn't brag about that. Uh, I do want to ask this one because this is, this is fun. Who's that in the middle? Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth. Who said that? Extra points for you. Good for you. <laughs> Pat, will you make sure she gets extra points? <laughs> Please. Babe Ruth, there's an interesting story about it. He didn't smoke cigarettes, by the way. He smoked cigars and pipes constantly. Uh, and there are no pictures of him when he died or when he was near death because he would not allow anybody to take a picture of him. Babe Ruth, the Bambino, who was this huge man, weighed 90 pounds at the time of his death. He was missing half of his face from oral cancer. Um, also died prematurely. The next is a figure that um, most of us, certainly from the U.S., know very well, and this is Edward R. Murrow, the most respected man in the United States of America in his day, the guy who brought down Joe McCarthy and his uh, communist baiting scheme. Uh, Edward R. Murrow smoked constantly on screen, also died in his 50s of lung cancer. Somebody told me this woman is Betty Grable. I don't know that for sure, but she is kind of the image, again, of sensuality, sexuality associated with smoking among women. That image came later than this one, because this was from the 1930s. It's a Chesterfield ad. The woman is saying to the man who's smoking, blow some my way. Now, why is she doing that? She's doing that because in those days, smoking by women was considered unacceptable. The tobacco industry could not advertise directly to women, so the concept here was to start advertising indirectly to them. Can you imagine today if a woman said to her boyfriend, you know, blow smoke in my face and I'll follow you anywhere? Uh, that was the message of this ad. And the people weren't laughing at it. It was working. And then, of course, there are all these ads, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarettes. There's the same thing for Lucky Strike, same thing for all the other brands. There were only five brands back then. Um, I had a colleague 
uh, still around, a very senior emeritus professor in the medical school, who explained to me how they came up with this figure, more doctors smoke camels. He was at a convention, I think he said it was American Heart Association convention in Washington. And when he came out of a plenary session, there were these very scantily clad young ladies who were handing out sample packs of cigarettes, I don't know, camels or whatever the brand was, and the doctor would take them and light up and start smoking a cigarette because doctors smoked in very large numbers in those days. And they said about 20 feet later, there was another young woman who had a pad of paper and a pen and said, excuse me, doctor, what brand of cigarettes are you smoking? That's how they came up with these. So they weren't lying. This is the imagery today. And again, obviously, it is totally different. Uh, we are talking about a behavior that is basically scorned by uh, much of the public and um, regretted by those who engage in it and for many of the others. So what's happened? We have this huge behavioral and cultural change. How did this occur? The anti-smoking campaign in the US, I, I want to be careful to say there is no formal campaign. This is basically the collection of all the efforts and activities that were uncoordinated that have occurred since the first Surgeon General's report in 1964. For nearly a decade, the focus of this campaign was information and persuasion. There was a very naive view back then, if you can imagine this today, that if people were simply informed about the dangers of smoking, that they would quit. And there were some people who did, but not lots of them. Uh, it it, it would, takes more than information, as it turns out. This is a pretty good drug. It's a pretty addictive substance. Phase two, starting out in 1973, was the first of the non-smokers' rights movements. This is the clean indoor air movement. I say the first because this wasn't really clean indoor air. It was sort of half of the air being clean. So they have a non-smoking section of a restaurant, that sort of thing. I mentioned at lunch today um, the very first uh, clean indoor air I experienced uh, was here in Toronto. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but I know it was before I got married. I got married in 1977, so it was sometime during the 70s. And uh, it was a very elegant restaurant, very famous restaurant. Had a non-smoking section because there was a new ordinance. I don't know whether it was state or provincial, uh, excuse me, city or provincial, but there was new ordinance requiring non-smoking sections of restaurants. So I went there and I was asked for non-smoking seats and the uh, maitre d' said, I'm sorry, but we don't have any. It's going to be about a 45 minute wait. If you're willing to sit in the smoking section, we can seat you right away. I said, no, you know, we really want to enjoy this meal. So thank you. We'll, we'll pass on that. We'll wait. About 15 minutes later, he seated us in the non-smoking section. All around the wall were these little non-smoking emblems, you know, the red circle through the line throughout and the cigarette inside. On every single table was an ashtray, and we were the only table at which there was no one smoking. <laughs> so that was an example of a policy that had been put into place but wasn't working real well. <laughs> Obviously, you and we and everybody else has done much better since then. Phase three is an era referred to as comprehensive tobacco control. Uh, I, I'm, as it was mentioned, I'm an economist. I tend to be, uh, therefore, very cynical and skeptical of lots of things. I'm not convinced that comprehensive tobacco control has significant synergistic effects beyond the additive effects of its individual components. But there is a belief out there that that's the case, and that's what kind of motivated that, that uh, movement, if you will. What we've seen since uh, the 2000s is the second non-smokers' rights movement. This is the smoke-free uh, movement, the entirely smoke-free workplace, so that we now have restaurants and bars uh, in multiple countries, 20 countries around uh, the world. And uh, I think, it, I, I'm not sure, is it all of your provinces or all but one have uh, smoke-free law? I'm not sure which. Nobody know? <laughs> all right, enough said about that. We'll move right along. Uh, this is also the era of global tobacco control. And again, I'm not going to be talking about that, but I think that's in some ways the most exciting area to be thinking about at present. All right, how, how has the change occurred? Now, this is me playing amateur sociologist. The professional sociologists in the room will please forgive me because uh, this is going to be ugly. But it's the way I think this through. You start with information and education, and you reach uh, an SES elite, smoking, a socioeconomic status elite. Those people tend to buy and buy the information and react to it. 
They, in turn, who are the most politically enfranchised, then lobby for policy changes. So both public health and social motivations, and some of them, frankly, are selfish as well. Why is it that the very first non-smoking workplace was the inside of airplanes? In the, I'll just say this in the US. I'm sure that the same is true in most countries. Why? Any ideas? Pardon? They fly when? No. What's that? First class versus economy class? No. How about this? Think about the US, and I'm sure you have a similar story here, but think about the US. What is the most important group of frequent flyers in the US? Congressmen and women. They fly all the time. They're going home practically every week or weekend. Uh, they're flying all the time. Most of them are non-smokers, the vast majority of them. They didn't like having smoke, so it was kind of a no-brainer. They passed that with ease. Cigarette tax increases have a similar feature to them. Who's going to pay them? It's not going to be me or you. It's going to be poor people who are dumb enough to smoke. And I put that in quotes, the dumb enough. Anyway, eventually the middle and lower socioeconomic groups start responding to social pressures and environmental changes. So we actually see significant decreases in smoking among the least educated in our populations. But they're not as large decreases as among the most educated. All right, what has worked to reduce smoking in the US and in general, this applies throughout the developed world. Well, I'm going to give you three categories of interventions. And by the way, this is a policy typology that applies to everything. It's not just tobacco. Pick a subject, and you have the same categories of policy always. Information and education, incentives, economic incentives, and laws and regulations. So what's worked? Well, early on, to set the stage, Information and public education, I believe, were critical. We're trying to learn lessons these days from the tobacco control experience for obesity control. And it's my sense that obesity control, a lot of people in tobacco control say education doesn't work. And we have, I'll give you some reasons for that. Uh, school health education is not very successful, doesn't do much. But I think early on, you have to be educating the public to get the momentum going. And I think that's certainly been true with obesity control as well. On the right here, you see Luther Terry. He was a Surgeon General who produced the very first uh, Surgeon General's report, got huge amounts of media coverage. The Fairness Doctrine ads were compensatory ads to compensate for cigarette advertising on the broadcast media from 67 until uh, the beginning of 1971. That produced the first four-year decline in per capita consumption throughout the entire century. We'd never seen it before. And, and this is something most people tend to ignore, but we had a spate of tax increases from 64 to 71. What's happened with tax increases in the US, like you, we have the state increases and the federal, and you have, I think you have federal, I know you have provincial. Uh, so what we see is from 64 to 71, state legislatures are just upping their taxes phenomenally. Why are they doing it? Because this is a situation in which you can do good for the public treasury and do well for public health at the same time. So it's kind of an easy one to argue. So you see all those increases, and that had a very significant impact in addition to the education. All right, this is getting back to that per capita consumption graph that you saw uh, in the beginning, but it only runs up to 1973. And what I want you to pay attention to here is a very simple notion. The argument has been made, or was made, back in the mid-70s. This is actually what got me into studying this. The argument was made by um, some observers that the tobacco control movement had been completely unsuccessful because the rate of smoking, as measured by per capita consumption, in 1970, let's say, or certainly by 70, no, it was about 73 or 74, was about the same as what it was the year of the first Surgeon General's report, 64. Therefore, the campaign had made no difference. Now, I took a look at what was happening to per capita consumption here, and I said, well, that's ridiculous. It wasn't going to level off by itself. Women were picking up smoking at increasing rates. The rate of smoking among women was paralleling that of men from 30 years earlier. And if it simply continued to parallel it, you would have seen what you see here is a yellow line. In other words, a continuation. This I've done just very simply schematically. I've actually done some regression analysis to estimate this more precisely. So it's not a smooth line, but that's the pattern that we would have expected. The green line 
In between the two is the adjustment for the tax. In other words, the tax increases would have depressed smoking anyway, independent of the anti-smoking campaign. So the net effect of all the publicity is the difference between those two lines, sort of subtract yellow minus green. And I think it's fair to say that the effect of the campaign, including the tax increases, is the difference between the yellow and the orange line. So there was actually a very substantial impact even early on. And if you trace out that yellow line to what would be its logical asymptotic level, that's why I say per capita consumption today is about a quarter of what it would have been uh, if had it not been for all this anti-smoking activity. All right, what's worked besides taxes? Clean indoor air laws, uh, the two incarnations I mentioned previously. Uh, the first were restaurants and airports, restaurants being half or less smoke-free. And now the completely non-smoking workplaces. Um, and then, by the way, you see here San Luis Obispo in California was the first city in the world to become completely smoke-free in 1990. Uh, but it took a while to get to the point where we were really adopting that kind of policy worldwide. Ireland in 2004, March of 2004, becomes the first country to become smoke-free. Uh, I thought that was pretty astonishing. If any of you have been to Ireland, you know how the Irish love their pubs and love their cigarettes, and they were giving up cigarettes inside the pubs. The then president of the University of Michigan, Jim Duderstadt, and his wife uh, were over in Ireland that month, and uh, he came back raving to me. He said they loved going pub hopping, but they'd always hated it because of the smoke. He said these places were 100% smoke-free. Just to put everything I say in a speculative manner into perspective, I don't always have any real good idea about what's going to happen in the future. Now, when I say that, let me illustrate it. If we go back a decade ago, 2001, if you had said to me that now we would have 20 countries that were entirely smoke-free, no smoking in restaurants and bars included, 30 U.S. states that were smoke-free, and on and on, and it would have started out in Ireland in 2004, I would have asked what you were smoking. <laughs> I wouldn't have believed it. I would have thought that was a crazy thing to say, and yet here we are. So taxes I've mentioned, restrictions on advertising and promotion, particularly bans on all forms of advertising and promotion, do reduce smoking. The best estimate is about 6% compared to no restrictions. That doesn't solve the world's smoking problems, but let me suggest something, 6% of the kind of problem we're talking about is a huge public health effect. Effective counter-advertising works. Warning labels, uh, we don't know. You all are the innovators in this area. Your warning labels were among the very first to have half of the packs dedicated to uh, warning labels with graphic imagery. And I understand you're working on getting a larger proportion of the packs. I wish you luck with that. That would be a terrific accomplishment. You've got a ways to go. Uruguay, which is being sued by Philip Morris, has a, uh, a new law that says that they will have to have 80% of their packs, both front and back, devoted to warning labels. Uh, comprehensive tobacco control problems, uh, programs, eh, as I say, I'm, not, I'm just not certain about that one. Oh, you know what? I do want to mention one thing. Uh, and I may be coming to this later, but since I don't know for sure, I'll just say it right now. One of the things we've learned about the secondhand smoke issue that was really generated as a result of these policies uh, is that if you go smoke-free, you're going to reduce, and this is for a city or a province or a country, you are going to reduce the incidence of acute myocardial infarctions in, in terms of hospitalizations by about 10 to 15%. I didn't believe that when the research first started coming out. I just didn't think that was possible. There are now 100 studies from around the world. They range in numbers, but that's got to be about the right ballpark figure. Let me ask you this. Is there anything else? I, I do have this later, so I will skip it then. Is there anything else in the entire field of medicine and public health that can have that kind of public health impact with simply having the head of government sign his or her name to a piece of paper that says you can no longer blow smoke in people's faces in a workplace. It's an extraordinary public health achievement. There's nothing in medicine that comes close to that. 
All right, treatment. I, I, this is uh, something for you all to contemplate. You have much more knowledge about this than I do. Does it work? For some people, it certainly does. If they are properly instructed, counseled, it can work. And then when that happens, you can double or triple the so-called cold turkey rate of quitting. But does it work? Well, if we look at the population impact, there is no evidence that treatment per se has had any significant impact. Uh, there are several studies about this now ongoing. There are a few studies that have been done that say there is no impact uh, that we can observe. Um, there's a problem, and that is that especially with OTC use, over-the-counter use, people may not be using the products correctly, but I would suggest that even with physician counseling, they may not be using all the products correctly. This group, I'm certain, includes some people who understand how you're supposed to use nicotine gum. Physician groups do not. I have spoken before, I don't know how many of them, but let's say 20 physician groups where I've asked the question whether they knew how the gum was supposed to be used, and the answer they always give you is you give it to the patient and tell them to chew it. <laughs> that makes sense. It's gum. If you chew the gum, the nicotine all goes down into your gut. It's absorbed poorly in terms of nicotine absorption, and it doesn't work. What you're supposed to do is bite it once or twice. You'll feel a tingle. You park it between your cheek and gum until the tingle stops, and then you bite it again and wait till the tingle stops, and then you bite it again until eventually there's no more tingle. Now think about this, folks. If physicians don't understand how to tell their patients how to use the gum, and the gum is such an unfortunate misnomer, but if they don't understand how to tell their patients how they should be using gum, what are we going to do with complicated issues? Because that's not complex. All right, the importance of tobacco control. Well, first of all, it is health policy. We need to keep that in mind. And this is something that's very important. In the field of public health today, we talk about health disparities as the principal issue. Disparities among races, disparities among men and women, disparities among socioeconomic groups. Well, if you look at the major cause of health disparities for socioeconomic groups, smoking is right at the top of the list. We don't think about it that way, but if we got rid of smoking or leveled it out so the prevalence rates were the same across the education and socioeconomic strata, we would end up with far less morbidity and mortality disparities than we have today. And this is what I mentioned about the smoke-free laws, so I won't uh, belabor that point. So the aggregate impacts of tobacco control have been dramatic. They have occurred over a long period of time, and I've mentioned each of these, so I won't go through them. But take a look at them and then ask yourself, is there anything in any other area of public health where we have achieved the kinds of uh, accomplishments that we have in tobacco control? But we still have a job to do. Tobacco remains the leading cause of avoidable premature death in the U.S. We're looking at a sixth of all deaths still caused by tobacco. Something people are not so aware of, it's about a third of all deaths for people in their middle age. These are still working years. For every one person who dies as a result of smoking in a given year, there are 20 people who are sick or disabled. That's 9 million in the U.S. And 20% are continuing to smoke. So in most developed countries, and you all are on the lower end of this, there's a range of about 18 to 25% who remain smokers. In the U.S. on surveys, 70% of people tell us all the time that they want to quit, and some 30 to 50% try each year. That's a try is defined as 24 hours off of cigarettes with the intent of quitting. That's a definition that is used in the surveys. And something on the order of 2.6% or fewer, and I'll come back to the fewer, succeed in actually quitting. All right, here's the big problem about smoking. The remaining smokers are different from those who were smoking 20, 30, 40 years ago. They're heavily addicted. We we're having an interesting discussion earlier today about whether they're hardcore smokers or how many of them are hardcore smokers. That's an off-debated topic. The cessation rate in the U.S. and in most developed countries over the last half dozen years has fallen. In the U.S., in 2009, the, rate, uh, the prevalence of smoking was the same as it was in 2004. Hasn't budged. Now, we have preliminary data from 2010 suggesting it has dropped by a percentage point. That'll be great if that holds up. We're talking about lower SES. 
There are smoking, uh, the smoking rate among college grads in the U.S. is under 10%, single digits, but we have blue collar populations that are more than three times as high. And this is one that is highly germane to this organization and obviously to thinking about smoking in general. I fault the entire field of tobacco control, including myself, for knowing this, mentioning it in talks like this, and then somehow forgetting it when we go on to think about policy and programs and so on. As many as a half of all smokers have a concurrent mental illness or substance abuse comorbidity within the last 30 days. That is terribly important if you're trying to think about what smoking is being used for today. We also have the problem that there are people out there who may not want to quit. Now, if we ask on a survey, do you want to quit, and 70% tell us they do, first of all, that's the politically correct answer. Yes, I do. So probably it's less than 70% who really want to quit, and the converse is that 30% or more don't want to quit. All right, this is where I get myself in trouble with my tobacco control colleagues. That's a heretical question. Could smoking be rational for some people? And I'm going to suggest two groups for whom it may be very rational. Some people are addressing a biological need. If you look at the population of schizophrenics, depending on the study, their smoking rate is between 60 and 80 percent, so from three to four times that of the rest of the population. People who are depressed smoke at heavier rates. People with a wide variety of other substance abuse and mental uh, illness conditions also smoke at much higher rates. They have a harder time quitting. Doesn't mean they can't quit, but they have a lower rate of cessation. There's a belief among the psychiatrists with whom I've discussed this that in particular schizophrenics and maybe some of the other groups are dosing themselves, they're medicating themselves. There's something that they get out of smoking that is giving them some sense of stasis that they're not getting elsewhere in their lives. Now, that doesn't mean that we want them to keep smoking, but it'd be awfully nice to figure out what it is. Is it the nicotine? What is it that's making them feel they need to smoke? What is it that it's giving them? If we can figure that out, there are probably some much safer ways to deliver that drug to them than through cigarettes. And here's the one that I say I always get in trouble with my colleagues. There are people for whom the current pleasures of smoking outweigh the future costs. And as a former smoker, and it's been a lot of years for me, but uh, you can't tell me that smoking doesn't have pleasures associated with it. It was very pleasurable. Uh, and anybody here who's been a smoker knows that that's the case. If they don't, they're either, they've forgotten or else they're liars, one or the other. Or else they're right and I'm wrong. So I'll give you that option, if possibly. <laughs> But at bare minimum, obviously, you're avoiding withdrawal, and withdrawal from nicotine is an ugly thing, as it is from any addictive substance. Uh, there may be people for whom the prospect of losing even a decade or two of old age, when they may not have much money, they may not be able to enjoy it, they may have to stay employed somehow, may not seem like a huge cost in exchange, exchange for the small pleasure that they get from smoking today. I think we ought to at least consider that, and it raises a really serious question about what do you do with those folks? How do you think about them as public health professionals? All right, so where do we go from here? We're going to do the kinds of stuff you see up here on the screen. We're going to keep doing more of the evidence-based interventions. What are the results going to be from that? Well, for some of them, we've got limitations on what we can achieve. Once a country goes smoke-free indoors, its workplaces, how much further can you go? You're not going to get any extra benefit out of that. You do derive a benefit from doing it. You increase your quit rates by about 4% over no smoke-free policy, and you increase the, or decrease the number of cigarettes among remaining smokers by about three cigarettes a day. Uh, but you're not going to get any more benefit once you're there. Uh, running some of the programs like uh, media anti-smoking campaigns are very expensive. They've got to be refreshed periodically. There are all kinds of issues. So I think we're going to end up seeing incremental improvements. When I say prevalence is going to drop in the U.S. by 3 to 6 percentage points, I'll show you why I say that. By 2020, uh, I think the answer is going to drop by about 3 percentage points, not 6. So more of the same is equivalent to not enough. Now, what you're looking at here are the results from a simulation model that a colleague, David Mendez, and I developed back in the mid-90s where we basically just age the smoking pop, the, excuse me, the entire population year by year in the U.S. 
We have smoking rates by age and gender. We have smoking quit rates in three broad categories by age. We have differential death rates, depending on whether you're a smoker, a never smoker, or a former smoker. And if you're a former smoker, the death rate varies by how long you've quit. So we plug all those numbers in and we say, if we maintain an IR, which is initiation rate among new smokers of 24%, which is where we are now, a cessation rate of 2.6%, which is where we've been on average from the 70s forward, we're not there now. The cessation rate in the U.S. for the last five to six years has halved. We know that by looking at the, the data for prevalence, so that's very disturbing. But if you look at this, what it tells you, and this is where I really kind of do need the pointer, if you go out, first of all, take a look and see how well we did. 2010, as I said, it's supposed to be about 19.6%. We were right on the money. This, our predict, projections have been very good. At 2020, that's going to carry us to about 17%. Okay. Now, the U.S. Uh, Healthy People Goals for the Nation has a goal of 12% for 2020. Ain't going to happen. And I'll show you why in a little bit. It just isn't going to happen. Now, the reason we have a goal of 12% is because in 2000, they set the goal at 12% for 2010. David and I showed them our evidence that ain't going to happen. And now they've come back and said, well, what can we do? We can't raise the number after a decade. <laughs> So we had to stick with 12%. Okay, well, you know, if you look at our figures here, and if we get, uh, I'll show you some evidence, and if we get really good and improve things, maybe by 2030 we'd be able to get down 12%. This is actually a fit of some of the data uh, from the model starting in 1995. Uh, the line is the fit, obviously, the data points you see. And 2009, not shown here, would be immediately to the right of 2008. We're hoping 2010 is going to be lower. That's what we believe. What are we going to do? We've got to look for novel smoke-free policies. Grounds of entire factories and universities, have to, we have to think about them going smoke-free. Dalhousie University was the very first university in North America to go smoke-free. Uh, university of Michigan, as of July 1st, will be smoke-free. And by the way, Think about, uh, University of Toronto is a little different than, than Ann Arbor because you've got city streets all over the place which you probably don't have any legal control over, so people can probably smoke on the sidewalk. In Ann Arbor, we have three campus, main campuses. Uh, one of them is the main campus, which is in the city area, and there are city streets. North campus is this gigantic area. I don't know how many acres, but huge. Uh, houses many of our colleges, many of the dormitories. The streets there are technically owned by the university. This non-smoking policy is outdoors as well as indoors. Uh, we made a policy judgment that it was too hard for people to differentiate publicly owned from university owned streets, so we weren't gonna prohibit smoking on sidewalks. But on the grounds of the university, we will be smoke free July 1st. Many apartment buildings by either their own policy or municipal policy are now smoke free. Outdoor public environments such as public parks and beaches in many locations are smoke-free. On beaches, by the way, that are not smoke-free, the single largest type of litter found is cigarette butts. And there is a special issue, I think, of tobacco control. I'm not sure. One of the journals coming out that is devoted specifically to tobacco litter. And it's a really interesting subject. We have states in the U.S., not many of them yet, in which it is prohibited to smoke in cars that have children in them. Ask the following question. Are we going to get to the point where it's prohibited to have any smoking in a home that has a child in it? It's a pretty radical policy notion. How about entire towns and cities? We had one in the Maryland suburbs of uh, Washington. They passed a law saying no smoking on any public streets or any public parks, anything public and it was withdrawn about uh, a week later because of the furor it created, but it's happened. All right, we're gonna see more labeling innovations. Canada has been, and I trust will continue to be a leader in this. Uh, we may see restrictions on or encouragement of marketing of new products. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the term tobacco harm reduction. You may have heard about the E or electronic cigarette. Uh, this is an area of great debate. I'm not going to have time to talk about it now. If you want to, in the Q&A period, we can discuss it. But there's an incredible number of novel products out there which are intended to be substitutes for cigarettes for people who won't quit. Or, in many of the instances, products 
for people that the tobacco companies are afraid will quit. So we, I'm not going to go into but you can see what they are. There's the e-cigarette in the middle, and uh, there's camel snus, and there's orbs, and Marlboro sticks, and in the lower left you'll see Ipco Creamy Snuff, which is uh, toothpaste, tobacco toothpaste. I could go on. In, in fairness, by the way, this is my tube of Ipco that I got many, many years ago. It's much jazzier looking today from India. Uh, this is the one for export. And in fairness to them, because there's no requirement that you have a warning label on tobacco toothpaste, they put on their own warning label. And it reads as follows, caution, those not accustomed to the effects of this product should start with a small quantity. <laughs> OK, how about gradual reduction in nicotine to non-addicting levels? We in the United States, for the very first time, have the authority in the, Fed, in the Food and Drug Administration to regulate tobacco products. The authority is limited. They are not allowed to ban nicotine in cigarettes. It's not hard to remove it, but they're not allowed to require that. But nothing in the law says that they can't require the reduction in nicotine levels to non-addicting levels of nicotine. Now, when I say that, many of you will be aware that non-alcoholic beer frequently, maybe always, has some alcohol in it. It's just a very low level that doesn't have any effect on anybody. So you could presumably do something like that through the same process, by the way, that you remove the alcohol. Uh, you can, I'm sorry, it's caffeine. We take caffeine out of coffee. It's the same process as taking nicotine out of cigarettes. Uh, you could get down to very low levels of nicotine. Some of you will be familiar with a paper by Jack Henningfield and Neil Benowitz in New England Journal of Medicine. I think it was in 1994 where they first raised this issue. It's still kicking around. It's a very interesting <coughs> issue with some complexities to it. All right, and then there's the policy that I can't talk about and you can't talk about because it's considered verboten, and that's the idea of prohibition. You know, are we moving toward prohibition of smoking or tobacco products or something of that sort? Well, here's some interesting data. When you look at surveys, a majority of people, when they're asked, say yes, they would like to see cigarettes made illegal, at least in the States. If you made cigarettes illegal, you would definitely reduce smoking by quite a bit. You obviously would not end it. Who's the fellow in the uh, right depicted here? Anybody know who that is? No, I guess you're not old enough. Pardon? No, it is, it is Sultan Murad IV from what is now Turkey. Okay? You act like you don't know Sultan Murad IV. <laughs> you have gray hair like I do. You should know Sultan call him Mur for short. Uh, Murad IV, back in 16, early 1600s, banned tobacco smoking. And he said specifically that if you were caught smoking any tobacco, you would be drawn and quartered by four strong horses. In other words, the death penalty. Now, I don't know about you. I, uh, you get to a certain age and you contemplate different ways that you're going to die. And one way I don't want to go is to be drawn and quartered by four strong horses. He killed a number of smokers. He carried out the policy. And people didn't stop smoking. So that should tell us something. Prohibition isn't going to get rid of cigarettes. It will create a black market. Anything we do will create a black market. I learned this morning uh, that we indeed have a black market right here in Toronto with contraband cigarettes, probably because of the high price of uh, the regular product, the tax product. And you have all the costs that go along with this criminal behavior, loss of tax revenues, and so on. And then there are philosophical issues which I personally, and this is just a personal opinion, think deserve some serious consideration. If somebody has the knowledge, understands what smoking is doing to them, and they want to smoke, and they do it in the privacy of their own home where they're not hurting me or anybody else, not hurting children, I think that we ought to at least contemplate the notion that maybe they should have some right to continue legally buying their cigarettes. But that, we can argue about that one. That's a matter of opinion. We could have prohibition light. And I don't know that I'm going to live to see this, but I wouldn't be surprised to see this become the policy. A prohibition of combusted tobacco products with the allowance of non-combusted nicotine and, pro and tobacco products, at least some sorts of them, like the low nitrosamine smokeless products, which frankly are not terribly harmful. The snus example in Sweden, those of you who know that story, there's no evidence that that's caused any health problems over the last 30 years. 
There are a few, two or three studies that suggest it may have caused some problems, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Not a single study defines any cancer risk associated with it. Uh, and those products are actually higher nitrosamine than the current product in Sweden and being sold today by people like uh, Philip Morris and R.J. Reynolds. Here's a problem for us. What are we going to call our ultimate success? Is it reducing prevalence? And if so, are we talking about cigarettes or all tobacco use? And if so, what's the level? 10, 5, 0 percent? At what point do we declare victory, fold up the tents, and go home? We get down to 5 percent smoking, and we say, hot damn, we're, we did it. <laughs> Time to go on to another problem. We don't know. We haven't talked about this in tobacco control. Is our goal to eliminate nicotine addiction? There are a lot of people out there in tobacco control and public health who think that nicotine addiction per se is a bad thing. I'm not a medical expert. My understanding from Neil Benowitz and others is that nicotine has roughly similar effects to caffeine in terms of health consequences. It will raise your pulse and your blood pressure when you're consuming them. They will go back down after that. Uh, very similar effects on the body. Whether it has more adverse effects, I don't think we know. But nicotine, per se, is not terribly harmful in the doses at which people self-administer it. It's a rat poison. I mean, it's an insecticide and a rat poison, so you can kill yourself real fast if you consume enough of it. But that's true of all kinds of chemicals. Maybe the goal should simply be to get harm from tobacco use as low as possible. That implies, all these imply different strategies, different game plans. We've never really talked about it. We've never resolved within the tobacco control community what we're trying to achieve. Okay, you saw this before. This is what happens if things stay the same in the United States. Now, how about if we succeeded in decreasing initiation by a quarter and increasing cessation by a quarter? This is what you'd be looking at. And again, this is relative to the rates that were in effect by a roughly 2004, 2005. Cessation rate is already much lower in the last five years. Let's assume it had not dropped, and, which is what the model assumes here, and that we're going to increase cessation rates by a quarter. What this tells us is that by 2020, we could get down to 15% smoking prevalence, not 12, um, and that we would level out at something on the order of 10%. I should back up, by the way, and just have you look at the fact that if we don't change the initiation and cessation rates, and this, by the way, is just a truism. This is not something that uh, is just speculation. This is a truism. If we can't change those rates, we're going to level out at about 14% smoking in 2050. Now, do I think that's going to happen? No, because I think we're going to come up with lots of better ways to deal with it. But that's where we're headed today. So here it is in 2015. It would get down to 10% by mid-century. And if we could decrease initiation by half and increase cessation by half from where they have been in their steady state, we would get down to about 14% in 2020. Still didn't quite make it to 12. Uh, and we'd get down to about 7% by mid-century, and the number would still be falling. So I don't know whether you see this as a good or an encouraging or a discouraging picture, but that's the picture. All right, the take-home messages. Obviously, we shouldn't rest on our laurels. Uh, we're talking about a scourge, a public health scourge here. It's uh, unprecedented. We need to understand the difficulty of the challenge as we move forward. It's not going to simply be more of the same. That's not enough. We have to be creative in thinking about new policy and other approaches to tobacco control. We should use the evidence-based policies, which, by the way, are going to be enormously effective in the developing world for a long period of time. And we need to have policies and laws that uh, affect behavior both directly and through norm change. We have to set goals that are ambitious but realistic. And I do fault the US Public Health Service for not, for not taking the evidence that uh, has been provided to them and coming up with reasonable goals for the nation in the tobacco area. We have to be patient. In the short term, uh, those of you who are fairly new to your field, you look at it and you say, boy, it's tough to see things change. You know, nothing's happening. Here I am working so hard, and everybody else is working so hard, and nothing's happening. If you look over the long haul, if you have the privilege of working in a field like I have for this long in your career, the changes are really astonishing. I mean, I, I consider myself 
fortunate to have observed during my single career the rise and fall of the cigarette, a story that I believe is going to be one of the most important public health stories of the 20th century when historians look back. And this is important. We need to celebrate our successes. Sometimes we get too gloomy and dismal about things, but this is the most important contribution to public health in the past half century. We should let people know about that. Thank you.